happily be bigoted against the opinion that, like, against people who hold the opinion that non-binary people are so not you're a bigot. transgender. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, am, I, I, I accept your opinion. That. I accept your opinion. You give <laughs> your opinion and we can disagree. German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche was a vociferous critic of Christianity, and as a philologist, he was particularly interested in the history of the Christian lexicon. And one of the most shocking and disconcerting things that Nietzsche observed about Christianity is how that religion was able to completely transform the values of antiquity through an obscene manipulation of language. What was seen as weakness by the ancients was seen as virtue by Christians. Nietzsche called this process the transvaluation of values, and he believed that Christianity achieved that by changing the definition of some important words. Another author that cared deeply about how language can be used to manipulate and mold culture was English writer George Orwell. The corruption of language is a central theme in his novel 1984, where he describes a dystopian society controlled by an authoritarian regime that completely changed English and turned it into Newspeak, a language used to control people's thoughts and silence dissent. Orwell's novel was, of course, fiction, but Italian Marxist philosopher Antonio Gramsci looked at this phenomenon in the real world. Gramsci wrote about how the ruling class in a culturally diverse society manipulate the zeitgeist through the control of culture, which are the meanings behind symbols, behind words, the shared values between people, and the ruling class does so in order to manipulate the entire society into adopting their own self-serving ideology. Gramsci called this concept cultural hegemony. And finally, the concept of the spiral of silence by German political science Elisabeth Noll Newman explains how in a political environment where dissent leads to moral condemnation and isolation, people with controversial opinions will tend to keep those opinions to themselves, creating a false sense of consensus by those who share the views viewed more favorably by the perceived majority. Now, the reason why I'm bringing all of this up is because these concepts help us understand what I believe is going on right now in our political landscape, especially on social media. A few days ago, on the 23rd of June, Canadian YouTuber Gavin McInnes, who ironically founded Vice, and I say ironically because Vice is one of the bastions of wokeness in American media, was kicked out of YouTube. Now, for those of you who don't know who McInnes is, in 2016, he founded a group called The Proud Boy which has been reportedly described as a hate group by the FBI and has been linked to violent far-right incidents. Now here is McKinnis himself explaining the core values of the Proud Boys. I think being a man requires four things. You have to have broken a heart, you have to break someone's heart, you have to beat the shit out of someone, and you have to have the shit beaten out of you. Now, McKinnis says he has distanced himself from the Proud Boys a couple of years ago, but he does maintain the same violent rhetoric. Now, I didn't regularly watch his channel. I wasn't a subscriber. I had seen some of his videos, and I've never seen him directly calling for violence, but his comments were definitely incendiary, and you could say they were glorifying violence, especially violence against left-wing agitators and activists. Now my natural reaction when I hear about someone getting banned is to feel uncomfortable about it. I am someone who really cares about people having the right to express their views. But after my initial discomfort, I had to consider the history of Gavin McInnes because he was always on the edge of what I think is acceptable in a platform like YouTube. Because when you are condoning or glorifying political violence, you are beyond the mere expression of your opinions. You are advocating implicitly that your audience should go out there and start bashing people. And from what I've seen in his videos, it's arguable that McInnes was guilty of that. Now, at first, this seems like an isolated case. McInnes has repeatedly broken YouTube's terms of service and was kicked out of the platform. However, on the 29th of June, other accounts were terminated, including prominent right-wing commentators Richard Spencer and Stephen Molyneux. And in the case of these accounts, especially Molyneux, we are getting into censorship territory. I can already hear some of you screeching 
screeching at the screen saying that this is not censorship because this is not the government. Bullshit. This is corporate censorship. Google and YouTube have virtually the monopoly of their respective niches. If you are banned from these platforms, you are virtually invisible on the internet. Which is why I think as consumers and partners of these companies need to take very seriously when they misapply their own policies. Because it's their job, considering how much influence they have on the public opinion, to keep these platforms as politically neutral as possible. Because honestly, I don't believe that a $160 billion company has our best interests at heart. Especially when that revenue comes mostly from other multi-billion dollar companies in the form of paid advertisement. So forgive me to think that greedy multi-billion dollar multinational corporations are not the most reliable entities to decide what we can or cannot see on the internet based on their vague and entirely subjective understanding of what hateful content is. Now let's look specifically at Stefan Molyneux. It is my opinion that he's sexist. It's my opinion that he's racist. But I know a lot of people who watch him who disagree with me on that one and think he's none of those things. And that's their opinion. They are allowed to have it. Now I actually have the idea of a video where I debunk uh, Stefan Molyneux's arguments about race. I have already a video where I debunked many of the arguments that he put forward, even though I don't directly respond to him. But yeah, I think a lot of his arguments are based on completely misrepresentations of what the data about this topic actually says. And that is why I say he is a bad faith actor and I call him a racist. But in that video that I made eight months ago, I was clear about not agreeing with deplatforming and censoring anyone just for being racist. Being racist, as immoral as it is, is not a crime. And it shouldn't be a crime because that would be thought crime. The mere belief in racist ideology does not cause direct harm at anybody. Even if a racist voice their opinions about this topic, they are not hurting anyone. Words are not violence. And comparing Gavin McInnes to Stefan Molyneux, there is a very important difference between them. I have never seen Stefan Molyneux advocate for violence, quite the opposite. I have only seen Molyneux expressing clearly that he doesn't believe that violence is a legitimate means of achieving political goals. So even though his opinions about race, about women are condescending and sometimes demeaning, the claim that he's promoting hatred is an exaggeration. Hatred is a very strong word and I don't think it applies here. But of course, that's only my opinion and it doesn't matter because we are all at the mercy of YouTube's understanding of what hate consists of. Now let's look at another example and see why this is a problem. A recent video by Mr. Atheist was taken down by YouTube for breaching the hate speech policy. And ironically, a lot of people celebrating Molyneux's ban and washing their hands off it saying like, oh, it's YouTube's policy they can decide whatever they want because they are a private company, blah, 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 were just a few days prior outraged at YouTube for taking down Mr. Atheist's video. Why didn't you wash your hands off it in that situation too? Why the double standard? It's very easy to defend free speech when it's speech that you agree with that is taken down. But you only see those who truly believe in the principle of freedom of speech when they stand up against censorship of content that they don't like, of content that they don't want to hear. Taking that unpopular stance is not easy, especially when you have a following that you know that probably will disagree with you. That requires integrity, something that unfortunately most YouTubers don't seem to have. Now, Mr. Atheist appealed to YouTube and his video was correctly reinstated and maybe the outcry on Twitter helped, who knows. Molly New has appealed as well and a lot of people have showed support to him, including some prominent critics of him like Eric Weinstein. Now, I think Molly New should have his channel back, but it's very unlikely that that will happen. For example, he tried to stream on Twitch and he was deplatformed within an hour, despite the fact that he didn't break any terms of service on Twitch. He was just banned for being Stefan Molly New. So what is he seems to me is that just like what happened to Alex Jones a few years ago, Stefan Molyneux has been unpersoned by our Silicon Valley overlords. 
By the way, I just want to point out the sheer irony of a hard leftist, anti-capitalist channel like the Serfs celebrating multi-billion dollar conglomerates like Amazon and Alphabet unpersoning an individual because of his opinions. I mean, I can understand you guys being on board with censorship in China, Cuba, Venezuela, North Korea, but celebrating blatant corporate censorship by multinationals is a new law, even for you guys. Anyway, these small examples show a core problem with YouTube's policies as they are set. They are completely vague and up to YouTube's subjective interpretation. Like when YouTube says that they don't allow supremacist content, including music videos, why do they allow J-Rock and Kendrick Lamar's King's Dead to be played on their platform? That song is clearly on the perspective of a black supremacist, the character Killmonger from Black Panther. They also allow Maya's born free music video, which has some very explicit, violent, supremacist imagery. These are both pretty cool music videos, by the way. The point I'm making is that it's all up to YouTube's subjective interpretation. And I really doubt they will censor content from giant media corporations, because these corporations are the ones paying Alphabet's bills. Now, as you've seen, YouTube gives a few examples in their policy of what is hateful content. Now, let's have a look at another one. Protected characteristics is just a form of mental illness that needs to be cured. Now one of the videos that propelled Blair White to fame is one where she makes the argument that transgenderism, she's actually talking about gender dysphoria, is a mental disorder. Apparently that video violates YouTube's policy, but at the same time Blair White is of course transgender. So YouTube is in quite a pickle here. Will it protect the right of a transgender person to express her thoughts about her own condition or will it enforce its policy and censor member of a protected category. What should YouTube protect? Group ideology or individual freedom? Also, I want to point out the implied ableism in that example, which is something that contradicts YouTube's own policies. There is nothing offensive about having a mental disorder, and it seems that YouTube is only enforcing the idea that having a mental disorder somehow makes your opinion less relevant or makes you less of a person. If a condition is distressing and disabling, and I know a lot of trans people that will disagree describe their gender dysphoria that way, that condition is by definition a mental disorder. And there is nothing offensive or nothing to be ashamed about having a mental disorder. Anyway, to keep track of what I'm talking about, the problem I'm pointing out here is that since these policies are vague and depend on YouTube's subjective understanding of what hateful content is, I, as a content creator, don't even know what is censorable and what isn't. Does my video explaining sex determination in humans and explaining why people with DS these are not different sexes violate YouTube's policies? I don't know, because I know quite a few people who think that video is hateful speech. I have been called transphobic by woke folk because of that video, despite the fact that the video doesn't even talk about trans people, but anyway. But now I, as a content creator who spent several hours working in that video, am at the mercy as some fucking stupid internet YouTube to make that application of policy. And I potentially can have a strike on my channel or even have it deleted because I was trying to teach people some basic basic fucking biology. And what about my videos drawing Muhammad or criticizing Islam? Are those hate speech too? Religion is a protected category on YouTube's hate speech policy. And according to most wokes, drawing Muhammad is Islamophobia or even racism, depending on how far you are in the wokeness spectrum. And what if that's YouTube's next target to the chopping block? Channels that promote Islamophobia, like the Apostate Prophets, like Killiam International, the Atheist Experience. Who knows? who will be sponsoring YouTube's next big purge. A final point about this that I want to make is that it seems to me that YouTube has violated their own policies in terms of community guideline strikes. A channel is only supposed to be deleted after receiving three community guideline strikes within a 90-day period. By the way, if there is anyone in YouTube watching this video, I have a bogus community guideline strike on my channel that I have appealed seven months ago and none of you fucking Muppets have even looked into it. So move your fucking asses, please. Apologize for the little Karen moment there, but guys, I'm trying everything I can. 
Anyway, Molyneux claims he had no strikes on his channel, which, if true, means that YouTube has violated their own policies. It's completely unethical for YouTube to put out a policy and tell us that that's how they're gonna do things and then just completely ignore it. This is a very important element on this story that's being overlooked by most people. And this is why I say that what happened here is blatant censorship and the unpersoning of Stefan Molyneux. Him and others like Richard Spencer were summarily kicked out of the platform without any warning, without any chance to back up their content. And that is not how YouTube is supposed to handle these situations according to themselves. And that is why it's so baffling to me see other YouTubers so apathetic about this or even celebrating this deletion. It seems to me that people have completely lost the capacity to have some fucking perspective and understand what is really going on here. This is not just about some racist YouTuber getting the platform. It's not just about Stefan Molyneux. This is a lot more serious than that and a terrifying precedent on YouTube. The second major purging happened on Reddit. Now, I'm not gonna comment so much about Reddit. Benjamin Boyce put out a video about it. It's pretty good. I'll put it in the description. I recommend you go watch his video. The most shocking thing about Reddit that I have to talk about is that in their policy to protect people's identities and vulnerability, they made it explicit that their policy does not apply to majorities. They have no shame in saying that their anti-discrimination policy is blatantly discriminatory. It looks like this policy has been pulled out straight from the pages of 1984. It's crazy. Among the 2,000 plus subreddits that have been deleted, most of them were right-wing. But not all of them. Some hard-left subreddits have been deleted too, the Chapel Trap House being the largest one. Even though you could argue that there is a bias against right-wing subreddits, what seemed to be really deleted is politically incorrect content, left or right. That is the actual target. And actually the most controversial subreddit to be terminated is a mostly left-leaning one, the gender critical subreddit. Now those who follow me know that I am very critical of gender criticals. They love to say that trans people are a cult, yet they have far more cultish characteristic than the TRAs. There are actually a couple of churches of gender criticals out there. That's how far gone these red fans are. But still, everything that I said about Molly knew earlier applies here. This is blatant censorship. They have been unpersoned from Reddit due to wrong thing, which, by the way, is a common trend on the trans debate. I mean, if you show any politically incorrect opinion, you are vilified, you are dogpiled, you are burned at the non-binary girl stake. Even if you are trans yourself, I would say especially if you are trans, like woke seem to really hate transsexual women that speak up against the insanity. This trans debate is actually a textbook example of Noel Newman's spiral of silence. Now in the case of Reddit's application of their policy, they understand that gender critical radical feminists, a minority within feminism, is somehow a majority. Because again, we are completely at the mercy of their understanding of what a majority is. It's vague, on purpose because it gives them absolute freedom to interpret however the fuck they want. They can claim that gender criticals are a majority because they are cis. So their identity and vulnerability, which ironically are key elements of gender criticals grievances, are not protected by Reddit's policies. Now after the purge, Reddit changed their policies. They no longer mention majority. In fact, they rephrase it to, this policy does not protect those who promote attack of hate or who try to hide their hate in bad faith claims of discrimination, which is just as vague and doesn't mean anything. To be honest, I don't even know why this platform is even bother at this point. Their policies might just as well be this. Be excellent to each other. And party on, dudes! Even though dudes is gendered language, so have to replace that part to party on, gender non-specific people. And the worst of it all, you know I'm not being sarcastic. Please do not use gendered language to, to address everyone. What a time to be alive, guys. What a fucking time to be alive.
The last piece of news I will comment about is something else that happened on the 29th of June, the day of the purge. Here's from Vice News. Facebook ad problem just stirred into a full-blown crisis. Mark Zuckerberg is scrambling to appease Facebook's critics as big and small brands pull their ad money, but it doesn't seem to be working this time. It started as a murmur of dissent, but over the weekend, the campaign to persuade brands to boycott Facebook ads for the month of July turned into a major crisis for the social media giant. It began badly on Friday when Unilever, one of the world's biggest advertisers, announced he was joining the Stop Hate for Profit campaign which had already been backed by Verizon, Patagonia and Ben and & Jerry's. Facebook quickly tried to take action and stem the outward flow of ad dollars, announcing a new policy that would follow Twitter's lead and begin labeling questionable content. But it wasn't enough. Coca-Cola and Hershey's joined the campaign soon after, and throughout Saturday and Sunday, dozens of other companies, large and small, added their names to the list. A little further in the article, there is a very important detail. Facebook makes 98 of its annual 70 billion revenue from advertising, and the impact of the campaign has not gone unnoticed on Wall Street. Facebook's stock price tumbled more than 8% on Friday, after Unilever's announcement, wiping $56 billion off Facebook's market value. Now, this news ties everything together. What happened is that the bosses of the social media companies, the real bosses, are giving them an order. And those that don't comply are not gonna have Christmas this year. Do you really think that the social media platforms that don't manufacture anything have any autonomy over their own platforms? The internet has been sold to corporate America a long time ago. Stephen Molyneux, in his manifesto that he published on Twitter, says something very interesting about social media platforms deleting the center, trying to push people to the extremes. The goal, of course, is to remove the middle so that there is no center to society and everyone can gravitate to the extremes wherein the tinderbox of violence can be lit. Now that is a lot of horseshit. What is actually going on is corporate America influencing discourse in social media during year of election. Because they don't really want a certain candidate to win. And don't get me wrong, I don't want him to win either. So it's not the middle that is being silenced, it's mostly the far right, where Molly New belongs to, and the hard left. I mean, no one is stupid enough to think that multi-billion dollar multinationals are hard left. Come on. Well, maybe Sargon. And Dave Rubin. Definitely Dave Rubin. But I still think that most people have not completely lost their minds and know that multi-billion dollar companies don't really care that much about left and right. They care about you keep yourself entertained in Netflix and with makeup community drama, keep purchasing and buying and spending, of course, and vote Biden. Now, after these crazy days that we are living, I added a new entry on the Woke Speak lexicon. Hashtag stop hate for profit is hashtag Joe Biden 2020. And finally, to those anti-capitalist lefties who are apathetic or celebrating multi-billion dollar conglomerates meddling with US politics by bullying social media platforms into making their environment a little bit more favorable to a corporate democratic candidate, here's a final concept for you, one you should probably revise. This one falsely attributed to Russian statesman Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov. The concept of the useful idiot. I've been Sarah Michelle. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers. So this is how liberty dies. With thunderous applause.